Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. In this week's episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast, I speak with Douglas McKee and Edward O'Neill, co-hosts of the Teach Better Podcast. We talk about teaching and pedagogy at university level, as well as the hardware and software used in the classroom, including video capture, as well as team-based learning and why there is a need for organisational change in order to embrace the new technologies available in higher education. You can check out all the links, resources and books mentioned by Doug and Edward over at economicrockstar.com forward slash Doug and Edward. Never miss an episode of the Economic Rockstar podcast. Visit economicrockstar.com, submit your name and email and you will get each episode straight to your inbox. I think a lot of people that really care about teaching, at certainly at the very high level universities, and I think actually across the board, they're pretty isolated. Uh, many departments are full of people that are passionate about their research, but are not passionate about teaching. And so we feel like we're in some sense creating community where there isn't any community. There's a lot of research on engagement. And some of the more sophisticated studies, they look at the relationship amongst variables. And it's things like, you know, if the student doesn't engage, then it's very hard for them to start learning or it's very hard for them to be motivated even if they're not even engaged. Hi, Frank Conway here, and you're listening to the Economic Rockstar Podcast. I am so honored to have the co-hosts of the Teach Better Podcast, Douglas McKee and Edward O'Neill. Hi guys, welcome to the show. Hey Frank, good to good to be here. Yeah, glad to be here. Douglas McKee is a senior lecturer at the Department of Economics at Cornell University. Dr. McKee teaches econometrics, probability and statistics and has previously taught at Yale. Doug's research interests include development economics, labor economics, health economics and structural estimation. Edward O'Neill consults and serves to solve teaching and learning problems for professors and supports academic and other projects with learning design and technology services. Both Doug and Edward co-host a Teach Better podcast focusing on expert level university teaching and pedagogy. You can check out the podcast over at teachbetter.co and on iTunes where there are currently 45 amazing episodes on teaching in the classroom and on the education system. I've had a recent listener reached out to me by email, Jim Lurch. I'd like to give him a shout out here. And this is a quote from his email that he sent me. He said that Doug McKee's and Ed O'Neill's podcast, Teach Be- Better Teaching, is fantastic. I would love to hear you have a conversation with them. Doug teaches econometrics at Cornell, so I'm sure you would have a lot in common. Their focus is on teaching practices, and I always enjoy hearing about this topic. So that's a, a great endorsement. Oh, boy. It's, it's always nice to have fans. I'd like to know what made you start the Teach Better podcast. Edward, do you want to take it? Um, well, actually, Doug came to my unit when I worked at Yale for, for services, and we sat down and had a consult. And um, I wrote a, like a ridiculous um, – like, I think it was like a six-page set of recommendations, which is total overkill. You should never tell someone like the six six pages worth of things that you think they might – they might do but um i'll actually tell you about three months later it's he who was doing all of them was, but we started having lunch together and talking about teaching and learning and technology and and higher ed life and uh and then one day doug said to me outside the you know his office building said um do you like podcasts um and i was like well you know i used to listen to podcasts more than i do and, and he loves podcasts and um so we, I said you should do a podcast about teaching and learning, and uh, I'll and I'll I'll help. That's my version. Oh, yeah, What's the yeah. Rashomon Doug version? All right. So here's here's my take on it. Here's what happened. So about a year before I met Edward, I had been listening to a lot of podcasts, and I went looking for one about teaching because I figured while I was folding laundry and grocery shopping, I should be learning something about about teaching and I didn't have a lot of people to talk to about teaching. And so I figured this would be a good way to do it. And I couldn't find one. And I just kind of shelved the idea. I was like, Oh, well, I guess it doesn't exist. And I went about when I, instead what I did is I made, started making a list of people at Yale doing interesting things in the classroom that I would hear about from my students. And I just would kind of, my plan was to work my way down them and have lunch with these people. 
Well, the following fall comes along and I meet Edward and we really hit it off and we have these lunches where we just like can't stop talking about teaching. And I said, oh, my God, this con- these conversations we're having are the podcasts that I've always been looking for. And then Edward tells me that he actually knows a fair amount about audio production. And I had my list of people that I was going to have lunch with, which suddenly became our guest list. And it was all perfect. And we were like, well, I've got a little bit of a computer background. We could probably make this work. And from then on, we were, we were off and running. And I will say that it, it turned out we were not actually the first uh, Teaching in Higher Ed podcast. There's a, there's a great podcast that Bonnie Stahoviak hosts uh, called Teaching in Higher Ed that um, is What's also great and, and quite different from in style, but uh, very similar substance, substantively yeah. uh, to what we do. So your podcast initially started out speaking to colleagues at Yale, and now you're kind of obviously you're moving on to Cornell. But your whole intention, I look back on your before you actually went on to Cornell, that your intention was to branch out to other universities and other colleges, and that. I mean, to be honest, the reason that we did it, but most of our guests were at Yale, was because well, that's how that I would talk to my students, and that's how we would find out where all the interesting stuff was happening. Um, it also was really nice to record in person. It's you get a nice feel for, I don't know. We've we've become more comfortable uh, recording episodes with remote guests since then. But in the moment, it's it's a very comfortable feeling having everyone in the same room. Yeah, you're having this this chat, and uh, and and some people would show up, and they kind of weren't sure what a podcast was or. Where does this go? Is this radio? What is this? And also, you're doing audio production, like in a professor's a professor's office with a a desk full of uh, equipment. But pretty soon, after you put on the headphones and stuff, you know, you get people talking about stuff that they're interested in and that they care about, which I think is the key to teaching: is caring about it. And uh, pretty soon, you forget about all those details and you just kind of get into it. And also, you know, in in terms of scope. I feel like we ended up accidentally doing a portrait of kind of great teaching it at Yale, which, uh, you know, I, I'm putting that material together and trying to figure out, like, how could we get, like, an, uh, a book uh, out of this? Because I do think we learned a lot. We had a lot of kind of summary episodes where we looked back and kind of synthesized what we had learned with clips, and which I think are really kind of – it's almost like an index to the rest of the show. Um, and I, I think you do learn something specific – by talking to the teacher about kind of their experiences and, and their point of view. It's not the same as an empirical study of learning on the student side, but I feel like the mindset of a teacher is so important. Like well, what is it that makes you think I could, I should, maybe I could try something else or maybe, maybe I could do things a little differently or what am I, what am I going for and how will I know I'm there? That's what I was just going to say. Having, that, that all those those guests from Yale makes it so unique and so interesting, and you have all those different perspectives. And you've touched on not only your own discipline, whether it's economics or whether it's to do with uh, technology or online teaching. It's to do with the interdisciplinary approach and bringing all those academics together in your room and having it available as a podcast and as you said you synthesized it in terms of making a possibly a book or an ebook and this that's a fantastic resource for anyone to to get their hands on really and find out what's actually going on today in one of the top universities globally so yeah let, let me add two things to that so one is um i think a lot of people that really care about teaching at certainly at the very high level universities and i think actually across the board they're pretty isolated. Uh, many departments are full of people that are passionate about their research, but are not passionate about teaching. And so we feel like we're in some sense creating community where there isn't any community. And we see that even with our guests where I would say that there was one time I remember really clearly that they kind of symbolized what would happen in many episodes. And it was with Jonathan Holloway at Yale and I asked him a question and he paused and I said, you must get that question all the time. And he says, well, no, actually, I've never sat down and really talked about what happens in my classroom with anyone for more than a minute or two. And so we're just we're opening up this thing that's really special that that just nobody really has access to. And so a lot of our guests, they're not like 
they're not stars. They're not already famous for something else. And then we're bringing them on the podcast. It's they're just people doing a really great job in kind of in anonymity. And so it's, it's really fun to give them a voice. And I love that idea that it's, yeah. I mean, I think the way you framed it, Doug, was perfect, which is it, these are conversations. It's not the right answer. Everybody has a different thing that works for them, and people are in different contexts. It's the ability to have that conversation. I remember when I was at USC, and we would give people grant money in order to do research for us about teach about their teaching, and to you know try something different in the classroom. And so it was all you know the willing uh, and people who are excited to do it, and. Um, we would have these workshops to get them trained up on what they needed to know. What do you need to know about social media or video or whatever it is in order to complete this project? We had like kind of one day to get them um, to get them up to speed. And I would design the workshop and, and facilitate a bunch of it. And in a, invariably, at the end of the workshop, at least 20 or 30 percent of the people would come to us and say, it's so good to talk about teaching not for a minute next to the photocopier or the water cooler. And – we never do this, and why do we never do this? And I think teaching learning centers try and make this um, happen. And, you know, here we are in the cyber sphere, you know, um, making this happen in a slightly different way. A number of my guests I've reached out intentionally because I've come across their own teaching methods. And most recently, some of the guests that I've had are applying or using, say, popular culture in their classroom. And, for example, I've had... Brian O'Rourke using superheroes to explain economic concepts. Someone else um, using Star Wars and Harry Potter uh, to explain the financial crisis and monopoly and systemic risk. Um, you know, so and Treconomics was another one, so economics of Star Trek and scarcity. And so all of these are, and even on other things like music and the concept of music and how students can relate to inequality or poverty in some of the lyrics and songs. And these academics are using that in their teaching to explain these concepts and musicals as well. So, you know, this is something that has opened my eyes since I've started my podcast and how I can actually do it. And I actually adopted that approach in teaching microeconomics as well. And I've given assignments based on that. And students love it. I mean, the whole key is to connect what you have to their world. You want they're going to understand it better and they're going to care about it more. I mean, it's pretty great. And so many um, I mean, you're teaching something scientific and I I think, you know, one could say economics. It's either about people and behavior, about equations. And and when you hear people talk about economics, it kind of goes kind of back and forth between the two. And I remember seeing someone trying to explain, give a little economics lesson once and um they just went up and started drawing a graph right away, um, and they were trying to talk about setting price, how to how do prices get set. And I was trying to think of an example like a razor blades. I go and buy a razor blade to shave the you know the half inch of my face that I shave, um, and I couldn't connect the equation he was describing to kind of a concrete example. So, I mean, I'm. I'm not in that area, but, you know, one issue in higher ed is we deal a lot with abstractions and the students don't necessarily cotton to abstractions in the same way. So like Doug's saying, like, what do, what do they already understand and how can you help them kind of reorganize that so that it's, you know, follows this principle? I'd love to ask Doug what his teaching approach is with econometrics since you mentioned equations there, Edward. <laughs> Let's sting him on this one. <laughs> it's... So we uh, so the last guest on our, our podcast was Steve Strogatz, and he said something that really hit home with me. He's a math professor here at Cornell. Hey, Austeria. Yeah. And he said, and so he's and he's written a bunch of books. I, I wouldn't be all that surprised if a fair number of your listeners had come across either Sank or The Joy of X. This is one of his. And he's just and, as fun as a guest as he is, you know, as a presenter, et cetera. Uh, he's just. I must get him on because I lecture at Chaos Theory myself. He's an amazing person. He's an oh, amazing. Get him he's on. amazing. Yeah. Um, but what he said is, he said that students are there are several types of students, and they're each motivated by different things. So in math classes, you've got the students that are motivated by applications. You've got students that are motivated by 
kind of the pure math. There are, there are students like that. They want that. And there are, there are students that are just, they're motivated by the competition. They're all different kinds. And I think it's the same in economics. Uh, and so I try to appeal to different students in different ways. Now, one thing I always do is I always try to start with a story. And so there's always one to three kind of substantive frameworks around which the the, the whole lesson uh, is built on top of. And so that might be how do telecommunications firms price internet service? How do how would a coffee company decide how much to sell their coffee for? Uh, how would a health clinic forecast the number of 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 patients that are going to come in that day? Okay, and and what I always try to do is kind of lay out the story and then ask what I think is an interesting substantive question um, for which you need the tools that I'm going to teach that day to solve. And so everything is then in concrete terms. I don't have to talk about uh, let's regress Y on X. It's let's regress prices on or let's regress uh, quantity sold on prices where we have experimental variation. Um, I try to make everything concrete. So I, I hate when when people think about epsilon as a Greek letter. I say I don't think about epsilon as a Greek letter. Epsilon is very concrete. They're the things that are very real and concrete that we just don't have measures for. And in every case, I'm like, let's think about what's in there. What could it be? What things determine wages that are not how much education you have and how much experience you have? And then you can talk about whether or not those kinds of things like height, height well, sure, height, height's not so hard to measure, but like social it, class. And it does affect wages. <laughs> it does. In, indeed, it does. But so does like family, um, family background. And that's hard to measure. But do you think family background is correlated with this thing? Well, we all we can we all have intuition about is family background correlated with this other thing. Well, if both of those things are true, then this very abstract and exogeneity assumption it becomes very concrete. So I, that's that's my basic approach: is to make it as concrete as possible. I I oftentimes uh, think about um, our guest uh, who worked at the Child Study Center, Carla Horowitz who talked about Piaget and the idea of stages development and that children start out, you know, kind of making and doing things. And then they end up playing with little kind of figures, you know, to represent something. And eventually they get to abstractions. And we in higher ed were fully in the world of abstractions. But Carl Horowitz said, well, in order to learn anything, you need to start off in a completely sensory experiential way and you need to try and do something and be active. And then you can rise to the level of abstractions. And um, I mean, I think, Doug, what you just described is trying to take people's first hand experiences and connect them with these um, abstractions. Sometimes I call this the three hands. There's first hand, which means I can see and touch and experience it happens to me. There's second hand, which means I can watch and observe it. And there's third hand, which is it's in a it's in a book or a representation or someone's rep, it's a reported account. And oftentimes, a lot of times in higher ed, we're entirely third hand. Everything's in a book. Everything's information. Everything's I never see anything with my own eyes and I never draw on my own feelings because that's, of course, kind of, you know, subjective. But if you don't get the three, it's very it can be very desiccated and not so engaging and it's very possible that people will know the formula, but they won't know what it means or care about it. Right, right. We are in education, or education is the one of the last remaining institutions that hasn't really changed or adopted technology compared to every other, I don't know. Um, industry. Industry. That's the Taxis, yeah. hotels. Airbnb and Uber. I why mean, you, where, where is, what is the equivalent in education? Why are we so restrictive? Why are we slow to take up? I think it's, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. Because we're trying to do the MOOCs and that's too difficult. I mean, the last time someone tried to, so the last major educational revolution that people touted turned out to be not as big as people thought, and that was MOOCs. So, so okay, so why didn't that work? Well, it turns out, I think, that 
And this has been known for a long time that the very best, highest quality teaching is one-on-one tutoring. And MOOC is about as far from that as you can get. And like MOOCs are fantastic. I like – the pendulum has swung way, way too far away from MOOCs. I love MOOCs. But they're very different. Like there's still a huge value add to attending a class in person. And w- when I say I really love large teaching large lecture classes – because I think a lot of what I do as a lecturer can scale up to very large classes. The, the teaching assistants that are actually getting to know the students are a crucial part of that. And so when people say like, oh, that's great. You can teach us a large lecture and then we can get rid of the discussion sections. It like makes my blood boil. Like you can't get rid of the discussion sections. They're critical. That's where the human element comes in. And so – when you've got a process that really requires that human element, I think it's hard. And then, and the outcomes, like you look at healthcare, healthcare also requires this really human element, but the outcomes are a lot easier to measure. Like right. you're either dead or alive, or you're healthy or you're not. Whereas, like, whether you're educated, that's much harder to measure. And I think we're making progress, and lots of things that we think are really hard to measure, that doesn't mean that we can't measure them. There, there was a cycle of movies in the 90s, that kind of virtual reality cycle, like The Matrix and Pleasantville and um, Dark City. And um, uh, several of them have a trope in them, which is um, that knowledge can just be injected into you. And so in Dark City, they have this – your personality is just kind of injected into you, and then it, it that's how kind of who you are is, you know, comes comes into be, you know, comes into being. And in the Matrix, of course, it's downloaded into Keanu's, you know, brain is, whoa, I know Kung Fu, you know. And I feel like that that summarized like a myth about knowledge we have, that it's like a substance, like liquid or something, and it can just be stuffed inside you like filling in an eclair. And it's not. You have to do something. I mean, nobody ever read a book about bicycles and rode a bicycle. No, no, nobody. <laughs> I mean, that just is not a thing. But in higher ed, we think, well, they have the textbook. They can watch the lectures. What's the problem? What's, there's <laughs> nothing left. There's What's left, left for us to do? Everything. Everything. I mean, that's why – let's just to say that's why active learning is so effective. Because it's the doing. So why why are we going straight for the third hand, as Edward said? You know, I know we are now more becoming more of an active classroom rather than have that passiveness between the the learning process that students take on. But we're still stuck in that. And I don't know whether it's because of the curriculum that we have to follow or because of the the educational system that we have to do this type of teaching because we are too slow to because the courses are only changed every four or five years or reviewed every so so many years and it gets very slow to to process and change to how we teach not how we teach but how we adopt and if i could bumper stickerize it it would be step away from the podium we're just so once you're up there you're just used to talking i mean when i lectured in large classes there was always questions and discussion kind of interspersed and uh, so you know it's possible to be get people engaged in a lecture class it's just the default i mean i remember myself lecturing and trying to rush through to get all the information out and and at one point i kind of did a little experiment and i discovered that when the students did the reading the students did the reading and they knew this information the the thing they liked about it was they liked confirming yeah i read that yeah i read that they just wanted to know that they were on the same page but i was I was actually wasting everybody's time, but it's hard to experience that yourself and realize it. And then it's even harder to just say, oh, my God, what am I going to what am I going to do instead? Picking up on that, I was just finding myself taking on different approaches depending on the type of module I'm delivering, whether it's theoretical or whether it's a mathematical or computer based. In a theoretical module, I just pretty much at the top of the lecture hall might move around a little, but I deliver the material uh, and I talk around the subject and in a mathematical or quants where there's PC or co- desktop computers, they do a lot of the work, as you had mentioned, Doug, in terms of trying to get a sense of the abstract equations that they're trying to deal with, but trying to figure out what variables are needed. So that's more interactive for me. And I enjoy those classes. So you asked a really interesting question a few minutes ago, which is, 
why are we always teaching with the third hand? Which I, I'm going to use that over and over again. <laughs> and why, why is it that we teach so abstractly? And what I think it is, is we know so much more. Like it takes five, we, we're like everybody who has a PhD was a great student when they were an undergraduate. And then they have like at least five years of training after that. And then frankly, like I feel like I'm continuously being a student and learning more. And so when I'm teaching, it's very hard. It's very easy for me. And I think for a lot of people just to go straight to like what we find really interesting as opposed to the foundation, which is what they need in order to get there. And so, wow, I just realized that R squared has this like really interesting property that if you want to, you can use it to define your standard errors when you have a multiple regression model. Like they're like time out. Wait, what are you talking about? And like, I think it's super interesting right. because I already know all this other stuff. Right. And so it's like if Ronaldo came and like tried to coach a, a fifth, a fifth grade soccer team, he'd be like, here's what I want you to do. I want you to curve the ball and aim for the top right corner of the net. And what he needs to be saying is, okay, when you kick, that means your foot has to touch the ball and you want to aim toward the net. So I think it's just in some ways teaching is very unnatural. And then there's the fact that like the vast majority of people teaching in college have never actually been trained in anything teaching related, which is kind of amazing. So it's not that surprising that like so many people are just sage on a stage, get up and talk. What do you think, Doug? You you said you were teaching before, and then you had left to move into a career on consulting for to professors and the and, and academia and the technology and learning outcomes that we adopt. Oh, Edward, yeah. I mean, um, Edward, yeah. Sorry. I mean, my trajectory. I just thought I wanted to just study obscure things and write really obscure papers <laughs> um, and publish them, which I did, and. I mean, now if I look on Google, it's like, oh, I'm actually kind of cited a few times. But it, it, for me, it wasn't as rewarding as you thought it was going to be. It just felt like I was dropping a pebble down a well and I never heard it splash. You know, I just wanted to write something that people would respond to. And, you know, I, I never started that huge argument that you want to start in your field where you say something, you know, sensational and everyone agrees or disagrees. And also, I loved once I realized that the learning part was interesting. And that the technology part was fun and that I wanted to get the students to play with technology and make videos and I wanted to do things differently. I spent a lot of time and creative energy on that and, and less on publishing really. And at a certain point I would think, oh my God, I have to stop getting the technology ready and write a lecture. This is just awful. You know, why can't I just play with the technology and focus on the learning and not have to do the information delivery part? And, and so there you go. That's what I did. I just shifted over to the other side and I discover what you could call the joy of helping, which is if I'm helping you, you know, if you're working on your own research, oh my God, is it good? It could be better. I need to read more. I need to, you just get, you can get really kind of, you know, caught up in it and um, trip all over yourself. Really. If I'm helping you, I don't really matter. I'm trying to help you. And so when I put myself in the helping position, suddenly just life got much more, much easier. My professional life got my, uh, much easier because I'm just trying to find out about you and who you are and what you need and what your students need and, and how to make everybody more, more satisfied with the whole experience. It's much more gratifying than, I mean, I still, I still love to write and I still have various obscure ideas that I, 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 I fiddle with, but it's really gratifying to, help someone make a change and achieve what they want. And I've seen a picture of Doug's setup in the classroom. And he's, <laughs> Doug, you have your MacBook Pro. You have something like two or three iPads. Yeah. You know, is this – is this the consultancy you got from the service you got from Edward or is this something that you decide to put together yourself? Well, so, okay. So, so I, I will On, admit and that. And a unicycle. No, the unicycle and wasn't in that, well. in the I, setup. I saw that post, somehow, actually. Some, somehow I'll have to work the unicycle into my teaching. I think you should. It's an, it's, they think I'm weird enough already. <laughs> I, don't really that. I don't need that. It keeps um, them interested. So my undergraduate degree is in computer science. And 
I feel like I have a comparative advantage with technology and I, it's somewhat of a hobby. Like I still keep up. I read like the computer blogs. And so I really enjoy fiddling with that stuff. And I always have a vision for what I want. And so last semester I wanted to be able to use like the standard clicker software and hardware setup that they have here at Cornell, which is iClicker. And that requires a hardware setup. I wanted to annotate my slides as I was lecturing. And so Instead of using a Wacom tablet, I wanted to use my iPad because the Apple Pencil is very responsive. And at the same time, I wanted to record my lectures because I believe that providing those as a service allows my students to both review and also to to time shift if they want to. They can skip class and watch the lectures if it's convenient for them. They can. They, I've had students that say they, they like to watch my lectures on 2X. I'm not sure how that they could possibly understand what I'm talking about. I already talk kind of fast. And so I just kind of kept building until I had what I wanted. And so I needed a wireless mic because I like to walk around. And there wasn't – at Yale, I didn't need all this hardware because there was a lot of hardware already built into the, the lecture room. Now – But it started it, – it started with clickers and then it right. went to annotation and then the tablet got added in. Yeah, and, it just kind of built. And then the video capture – was added in. So you did, it was an iterative process. Well, I mean, it, it's been iterative over the years, but it, but it was also iterative just during the, in the course of preparing for the semester. What well, video capture do you use? It's not Camtasia or anything like that, is it? It's Panopto. Oh, okay. So Panopto is kind of the, the video platform of choice here at Cornell. It's great for serving. It's fine for recording. Now, I will say, so my goal was to kind of learn the kind of the local kind of technology system that people use around here. That's Panopto and iClicker. Uh, but at the end of the day, I wasn't very happy with how it went. I also will, I'd also like to push the envelope so that I can then kind of tell my colleagues what I found works and doesn't work and help them. But at the end of the day, my setup next semester is going to be just as crazy and completely different. You're going to be like Iron Man. And so <laughs> it's, it's going to be total. It's going to be totally insane. But I think it's going to be great, and it's going to solve a bunch of problems that I was having last semester. You're, so stay tuned. Stay tuned for the new crazy setup. You're, you're not going to reveal all, are you? I, it's, I'm not, because I don't know if it's going to work. But I'm going to Does try it. Okay? Does it involve a hovercraft? It, it, it involves um, video conferencing software and annotating from anywhere in the room, which would be really cool. Right. And, a, and, a, and, of course, different polling software. So where I'm going to I'm going to use poll everywhere which I've never I've used once and it actually was not a very oh, positive experience but I'm looking for I'm going to make it work. It does some nice, really nice things. Yeah. What, what's a P O L L poll is it? Poll, oh, yep. Poll everywhere. Students interact with you? Yeah, you can set up a question, a multiple choice or open ended. Students can text their response. They can do it from a web page. It shows up virtually live. It can show up live in your presentation software. It's pretty, it's pretty wonderful. I've used it for professional training events where you want to get people's responses um, and they have laptops already. And so instead of stopping and going around the room, people can feed in their responses and you can see what they are, you know, statistically or individually. And it's quite good for connecting the learner in the process and not having it be about you so much. I suppose we have to learn. We, we can't try and reinvent learning. We must adopt what's going on today, like especially, say, with social media and how younger people are interacting more so and we kind of have to move with that rather than trying to, you know, so poll is probably a fantastic way of creating that interaction. They definitely like it. I, I think it's, I think it's critical in a very large class to give you a good sense for what the students are understanding. So it, for sure it engages them and gives them something to do, but it also gives me really valuable feedback on, on what's sticking and what's not sticking. You know, in the research on learning, there's, you know, it's the metaphor of the, the visually impaired people and the elephant. You know, people look at cognition, people look at motivation, people look at all these different kinds of things. But when I, I look at all that stuff, um, there's a lot of research on engagement. And uh, some of the more sophisticated studies, they look at the relationship amongst variables. And it's things like, you know, if the student doesn't engage, then it's very hard for them to start 
learning or it's very hard for them to be motivated even if they're not even engaged. And so engagement in a large class, just, you know, do you ask them something and they respond? I mean, are they just a part of the process? It's just, I mean, we know from classroom research, if they're afraid of you, they definitely don't <laughs> don't engage, you know. So things like polling, it's, as you say, it's kind of a slam dunk. You were saying about, yeah, about keeping students motivated. But what about the academics, the lecturers themselves? Because we are being introduced to all of this new technology. We are not used to it. In order to adopt it, to set up, even setting it up in class, if you, like yourself, Doug, you're going to have to bring it with you. There's a set up time period. Uh, that's going to eat into class if you're if there's someone in there before you. There's the learning process. You know yourself. Try to and I, I understand setting up this podcast, maintaining a website, uh, creating content, doing YouTube videos, editing the podcast. You know, putting whatever else that goes with it, and that takes up an awful lot of a long a lot of time. This is something I think a huge amount about, which is how can we actually come up with a system that improves the quality of undergraduate education kind of beyond the small number of people that are just passionate about it itself. Like you, me, Edward, I'm sure there are listeners to your podcast, probably the majority of the listeners to my podcast, they want it already. They just need to know, they want help. What they don't want it. They want to know what, what to do. But once you figure out like the, what to do, how do you get your colleagues to actually do it? Cause you're right. It takes a huge amount of effort. And so you can kind of like tweak around the edges and help your colleagues and let them know, hey, you should try this discussion software or online discussion software. It says it's going to save you time and it's it means that students can ask questions anytime and get answers and everybody can read everyone else's answers. You have, you'll end up with less email. Um, it's a win-win-win for everybody. It's a parade of improvement. But – and then on the other hand – you could change the system such that promotion actually depends on teaching quality. And so, well, you better get up to speed and start doing this stuff and do a better job teaching or you're not going to get promoted. Well, we all know at the, at the, the, the big R1 universities, it's just we're not – that's not the situation. It's your teaching has to be above a bar. And once you prep like a, a decent traditional lecture class, it is. And then your time is better spent. The margin return to an additional hour is much higher putting it into your own research and so that's another way if we could change those incentives those big incentives that would be a way to do it but those seem pretty fixed i mean that's a coordination problem but i i, I want to emphasize that <clears throat> um I, lately i've been saying the the ultimate teaching technology is humanity uh, it's the actual human connection you have with the students and that that they have with you, and so uh, it takes I, time. Know, it's just what Frank said, though. Well, there are people. Uh, you know, we've had guests on our podcast who just do team based learning, for instance, and I think the technology is you know scratchers or things like this. It's not about the technology. You can use technology to innovate your teaching, but you can also just do things differently. And and um, that's where and hearing stories about what other people do in the classroom is helpful. I, there's a little video interview I did with Educause, which is a international learning technology organization. I'll, I'll send you the link, Frank. And it's kind of like, you know, three – I don't know, three things to think about in terms of learning technology. And I think one of them is start small. And That's so the key thing is what's not going right that I'd like to improve? You know, where's the bang for the buck? And what's the one thing I can do, the first step? So, Frank, I want to say that I've come around to thinking that, that it's an orga what, what we need is an organizational change. And so even when you – like. The way teaching improves is through investments. Like there are these like very high bang for the buck things that people can do, but you need this big push to get from traditional lecturing to active learning. And you can do little things along the way, but most people are probably not going to do that and it's going to take a long time. And so what you have to do is, I mean, provide resources and provide money and get people to actually go to do training and hire people that can do the training 
And that can be at the department level, that can be at the university level, and give people like an extra teaching credit or let them out of committee work if they make these particular changes to how they teach their classes. Um, otherwise, it's not going to happen. Otherwise, like the people that are great teachers are going to become better teachers and the people that are okay teachers are going to continue to just be okay because they don't have the incentive or the resources to change. Like I, I love listening to podcasts, but I have to be doing some other activity while doing it. Like you mentioned earlier on, Doug, that you wanted to – Listen to a teaching podcast while fold sometimes. laundry and grocery shop. That's it, yeah. So exercising or emptying the dishwasher or whatever it might be, listen to an audio book. Yep. You know, I I, yep. I get to listen and effectively read the whole book in such a short space of time rather than sitting down to actually read the thing and it kind of go it does go in, uh, especially if it's interesting content. You know, and I think I think that's what people love about podcasts on their drive home. Listening away. They're very efficient. Yeah, it's a, yeah, very very efficient. It's like an it's like an empty spot. It's a niche that is available, and we can and podcasts fill that niche. I mean, maybe when maybe when we have self driving cars, people will won't listen to podcasts during their commute, but they'll instead work or do something else. But for the foreseeable future, there are plenty of things that we have to do that are not cognitively high enough load or cognitively rewarding enough where our podcasts can fit right in. It's interesting to think about lecturing in that to flip it around and say, okay, well, people are sitting in a room listening. When you're listening to something, you actually like to be doing something. Right. So what are we doing having people sitting and doing nothing and listening? You, nobody likes that, actually. True. <laughs> right, right. And that's probably right. where – your module, Doug, is very useful because they they can actively get involved in the you know econometrics, right? Because they're listening, but they're also applying. Right, right. I, I guess. What about the, so you? you but wait, I I just want to go back because I feel like I didn't answer a question that you asked very early on, and I really want to answer it. And you were like, "How do you teach?" And I said, "The one thing, one of the things I do is I, I try to make everything very concrete." But another thing, and another thing I do is I have them actually do things during class. So I don't lecture for more than 10 to 15 minutes and then I have them work on things. But the third thing that I didn't get a chance to mention, and I don't think we've, we've talked about it all really is I give them an opportunity to be creative. And so instead, of, like a big chunk of the class is giving them problem sets and having them answer questions that I pose. But another big chunk of, of, I try to make this every class I teach now is they come up with a really interesting question and they use the tools that they learn in the class to try to answer that question and build something and create something. And, and the key is that they have to care about what the answer is up front. And that's a really critical part of the class. And it can be, I, I firmly believe that it can be part of any class, whether it's an econometric class or an economic theory class or a, an elective class in a particular substantive area, like an industrial organization class. Ed, I'd love to know, or sorry, Edward, are you okay with Ed or Edward? I call him Eddie Boo. Eddie Boo Boo. Yeah, Eddie Boo Boo. Yeah, either one. <laughs> I, I, you know, the, the consultancy you do regarding technology and the online learning and so on and the supports, the academic supports, I, how do people say find you and want to contact you if they wanted that type of consultancy in terms of learning design and technology services and what essentially do you provide? Uh, people see me speak. Uh, people find hear the podcast. Um, I do workshops for professional organizations in New England and people find me this way. I just did an online webinar about design thinking for um, Educause Learning Initiative I'm about to go do that at Bryn Mawr College down um, outside Philadelphia, and uh, people find people find me on LinkedIn actually, um, a bunch of ways. So design thinking is one of the things. For instance, I'm I've been training people on recently. It's kind of a big deal in the corporate world. I I focus on doing it for people in the startup world, but also people in in higher ed, especially if you're dealing with learning technology, because you have a lot of kind of problems to solve, um, you know, uh, around learning technology. And so I actually just wrote a 
book called Brain-Based Design Thinking, which is a, an Amazon Kindle book. It's about 30,000 words. And so I give presentations. People find me this way. People find the book. They find me that way. Find me on LinkedIn or if on Twitter. I'm, my handle is Learning Tech, so I'm kind of easy to find, uh, find that way. And sometimes people want some kind of particular training. I have different workshops I do on uh, helping students write on – different forms of media, make videos, things like this, helping institutions do emergency preparedness, what happens if it's to close because of weather or an earthquake or things like this. And the design thinking is a, is a big um, area. For economists, uh, I think what's in it for economists is a lot of times when design thinking is, is taught, there's no empirical basis. And I actually try and connect it to research in cognitive and clinical psychology, but also behavioral economics – because the idea is that the, what I get from behavioral economics is human reason has inherent biases. <laughs> and there are certain situations in which you're more likely to be biased, especially when you're making kind of very limited comparisons. So in higher ed, you're trying to pick a new video platform. If you only have one choice you're <laughs> or two choices, you're probably going to make a really kind of um, lousy choice. So I actually kind of build this into design thinking. Uh, the book is called Brain-Based Design Thinking, and it actually sells, I think, on Amazon um, UK now. The two. I'll definitely link that up on the show notes page, Edward. Cool. Um, you mentioned Edward, webinars. Sorry, uh, sorry, Doug. Yeah. Well, I was just say, Edward, can you just tell us your email address <laughs> <laughs> and your phone number? I'm I'm trying here. I'm trying here. I'm just thinking like, you got some listener who's who likes what you're saying and they want to contact you. Uh, LinkedIn. Find me on LinkedIn. That's the easiest. Way. How, many, how many Edward O'Neills are there on LinkedIn? <laughs> well, if you search for, uh, I think if you search for learning tech or Edward O'Neill learning tech. All right. Um, that he's would, winding up, isn't he? There you go. No, he's being helpful, actually. I, I wish there were an easy one-stop shop to find me, but I, I haven't found it yet. My approach to the web is to put stuff wherever I possibly can. Um, but I haven't got really a good central central hub yet. I need to find a consultant to help me with my consulting. <laughs> exactly. Ed, Edward, you mentioned webinars there. Douglas, have you ever used a webinar yourself in terms of teaching? I've done I've done it a few times where I just didn't have the time. I had a two hour module for a master's class called Financial Derivatives, and I used platforms where we do kind of online paper trading and simulation real time uh, you know trading options and futures but when these students are introduced to this for the first time they want a lot more time spent on how to uh, use the platform and that type of thing and it kind of eats into my tw two hours per week uh, module which i can't afford to use so i decided to hold webinars in the evening time and that's been quite effective i can show them my screen i talk through the um, the, the platform and how to trade these options and futures and type of thing. So it's, it works quite effective. Uh, and I'm wondering, have you approached that yourself, Douglas? I know, Edward, you mentioned you've done webinars and that is quite effective, but it's a new type of approach in terms of how we can reach out to the student. So I've done two things that are similar, but never anything that I would label a webinar. So there have definitely been times when I'm traveling, but I still have to teach. And so what I'll do is I'll record my lecture and then post it and then they can watch it whenever they want. But there's no interactive component to it. Google Hangouts are fantastic as well, actually. Well, I mean, the, the problem is like I'm traveling because I need to do something. No, so yeah, I can't really yeah. do the thing and teach the class. No, yeah. It's not just a location <laughs> issue. Unless you get a drive, driverless car. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. Uh, although I, I have to say, I, I have taught online from the Atlanta. I taught online from the Atlanta airport last year, which was pretty fun. <laughs> Okay. Which brings me to the second piece, which is over the summer, I teach online for the Yale summer session where my student, the, the structure of it is it's a five week course and my students, they, they watch about an hour of video and then they get an hour of online live video conferencing okay. where, and it, it's, and to be honest, it's, it's actually, it's a classic flipped classroom model where the video conferencing is the active classroom. And so I break them up into small groups and they work on problems and I ask them questions and I get to know all of them. It's a pretty small class. And and that can happen from anywhere. And it's been incredibly effective. And I use the, the Zoom video conferencing software. And I, I, I can't say enough good things about it. 
Um, although if you push me, I could probably find some bad things to say about it too. <laughs> I mean, I feel like uh, in dealing with tech, learning technology, I have three kinds of rules. And um, one is the the more complexity the tool has, the harder. So in general, pick the tool that has the fewest, um, and that's going to take away cog, you know, cognitive um, load. Basically, it's, it's going to take up energy and time. So it, pick the tool that's as simple as possible, but no, no simpler. And if you, that means you need more than one tool, that's okay. <laughs> but the other thing is one-stop shop tool. Yeah, that's right. Those tools are usually terrible because they're too complex. Right. Um, another rule is. What's familiar is probably better. Like if you don't want to spend any time on learning a new tool, <coughs> if people are used to Skype, then just use Skype, you know, or if people are used to YouTube, then just use use YouTube. So, you know, use the simplest tool, as uh, simple as possible, but no simpler and start with the tool that they already they already know. Sometimes special built tools that are created just for academic purposes are the worst because they're new and people don't use them all the time. I'd love to ask you both a couple of quickfire questions, if you don't mind. I tend to ask my guests these questions, so you can jump in if you want to answer, answer if you wish. I'm ready. Right. I'm ready. If you could step into the DeLorean and time travel, what era would you like to go back to? Who would you like to talk to? And what conversation do you think you'd have? All right. So you, you sent me some of these questions ahead of time, so I've actually thought it through. So can I answer this one first? All right. So this is Doug. I have to say, like, there's, I feel so underread that there's tons that there's lots of really interesting people out there for which I feel like I really would be better off just reading what they've written. And so I'm not going to pick someone like Socrates because I'm better off reading what he has written instead of going to talk to him. The language issue might be a might be a, language might be an issue, too. Uh, so what, what I, I would want to go back and, and see someone that. I would gain something from and enjoy that I can't necessarily get from what they've already written. And so I would go back and I would have dinner with Oscar Wilde. I can't think of anyone who would be more fun to have dinner with. And I find him truly inspiring. Like that's a guy who's so witty and just so willing to just be himself no matter the consequences. And so that's who I would pick. I'd pick Oscar Wilde. I had just had a conversation with my sister earlier on about Oscar Wilde and the picture of Dorian Gray. He's, in great, so, he's incredible. That's mad. Yeah. All right, Edward. I think, I think, um, you're you welcome know, my to mom come had... with me if you want. <laughs> I would love to tag along if we can take two DeLorean trips. Um, my mom has dementia now. And so she doesn't, uh, she's still herself. She doesn't remember a lot of things. I mean, my dad passed away like a decade ago and she doesn't, I just discovered that she no longer remembers that he's he's gone. She was asking me where he was. And um, I think I would go back and, and talk to my parents at an, maybe an earlier point in their life because my dad's been gone for about a decade. And now my mom's kind of, you know, there's so many things about her I would love I would love to know. She was a student of Benjamin Bloom's. She taught to uh, develop intellectually handicapped children like in a school, you know, in a church basement in the 1950s. I would just love to go back to my parents at some earlier time in their life and find out all kinds of things about them that I don't know and that I'll now I'll I'll never know. I mean just just to know them better. I mean it's it's not someone important and famous, but they're just people who are so so interesting to me and and I tell you by the time you're they're gone you realize just wow, who who was who was that person? Yeah. Mm. Totally, yeah. Makes a lot of sense. It does, definitely. Yeah, I think we'd all like to be there as well. You know, a lot of people out there would like to do that. Right, right, right. I would also like to know, you mentioned a book already, Edward, your own book, Brain-Based Design Thinking. But, Doug, you might like to jump on in this one. Would you have a book that you'd like to recommend to our listeners? Because I'm sure you've been exposed to quite a lot, especially during your podcast. Boy. Maybe it, it can be economics or it can be anything to do with um, teaching. I have a stack. Uh, I have to go get it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like I said earlier, I'm remarkably underread. And so the book I would probably recommend that like I think is the biggest bang for your buck book bang for your buck would be um, Frank Herbert's Dune. So it's okay. it's fiction. 
most people don't think about it as having anything to do with economics, but it actually has huge amounts of economics in it. It's a really interesting economy. It's a, ga- a galaxy where things are very, very far apart. There's this one good that everybody wants. It's only in one place. Everyone fights to, ha- to get the market power over it. The transportation of the good is this other party that has a monopoly. The book can be read on a million different levels. It's a book that it's a great desert island book because you can read it over and over from different perspectives. The characters are really rich. I mean, you can read it as just a pure swashbuckling science fiction novel. You can read it as saying deep things about ecology or even religion. It's a big book, but I I can't recommend it more highly than that. Yeah, I'm kind of a learning nerd. Of course, Ken Bain's book, What the Best College Teachers Do, is a classic, and I've read it numerous times. I'd say it repays. Uh, it, it's pleasurable to read. It's nicely written. There's a woman named Ruth Colvin Clark, C-O-L-V-I-N. Uh, she's written many books taking um, research about cognition and applying it to especially kind of online learning and stuff. But I have her book, Building Expertise, which I think is really excellent. They all draw on the same research, and she's beautiful at kind of summarizing it and pulling it together. And then like one of the big kahunas in um, kind of multimedia learning research is Richard Meyer, M-A-Y-E-R. And if you search Richard Meyer multimedia learning, you'll probably find a five or six page PDF, which just summarizes a lot of what he what he does. And it's things like, you know, if I'm creating a piece of instructional content should i have words on the screen or pictures or should i should they be spoken or or written and you know what's going to help what's going to help people learn more some of the stuff is not that surprising like preview the main point in simple terms <laughs> that helps people s- learn richard yeah. meyer m-a-y-e-r yeah if you search richard meyer multimedia learning pdf You'll probably find a little kind of six-page um, summary, and I, I use that stuff. I use that stuff constantly. I'd love to know if you have. Any, I know we touched on a couple of hardware, technology, and software, but are there any recommended resources that you'd like to suggest to any listener who would like to go down this route of teaching online or bringing it into the classroom? Uh, Educause edu in the U.S. Uh, website. They're kind of learning-focused areas, Educause Learning Initiative. And they have uh, little PDFs, seven things, seven things you should know about. And then I actually work on the editorial committee for seven things you should read about. And so it's trends in technology and learning. And they're little two-page PDFs. And, um, and, and it, for the first few months, only members can see them. But after a few months, they're freely downloadable. So if you search for Educause, so seven things you'll find these um, these PDFs and there's every topic you would kind of possibly think of. So if you just want to get an introduction to something or just want to see what is what is distance learning or what should I know about it um, or what is lecture capture, it's a lovely resource and finding a nice, clear, simple introduction to things can be really hard. So I like those. My advice is to just do it. Yeah. Like Try if, it. If you're waiting around, like, I don't want to do online teaching until I read the right thing and, like, know exactly what I'm doing, you'll never do it. Because chances are you're not going to have much of an audience at the start anyway, but you might as well. Exactly. exactly. You might as well do it to people you know and, and learn from. They can give you the feedback and it's not as embarrassing. It's like your first draft of a, of a paper is always awful, but there has to be a first. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I was just thinking, did I send you another question, Doug, by any chance? You wanted to know if we had any tips on writing. And so as somebody who is not a natural writer, uh, this is like writing is writing anxiety is something I've struggled with for years. What I found is that I was running into exactly like a, like a textbook standard problem, which is trying to write the final draft immediately. So write the first sentence first and write the second sentence second. And guess what? Like that doesn't, you don't get very far that way. And so just using kind of standard brainstorm first, write down everything you can think of, just get that, get the ink flowing, whether it's ink or whether it's typing doesn't, I don't, I don't have a strong opinion about that. And then organize and call and then final edit. Like that's a process that works really well for me getting from kind of point A to like an idea to actually having something written. And then write. I mean, writing every day is great. I'm I'm terrible at doing anything every day, 
I, I can brush my teeth and floss my teeth every day. But beyond that, and like get up. But beyond that, I'm terrible at like daily habits. But but regular, like at least try to write. The the longer you go without writing, the harder it is. And so write as much as you can. That's my advice. I'd love to hear Edward Stoppins on that. You know, I was trying to formulate something like this recently, and it was something like, you know, the the it's difficult to write something that needs to be written in more than one sitting. And so I think there's a, a great deal to be said for writing something in one sitting that's finished, but small. And I call this kind of I call this rule ABD, always be done, which is you're going to write a big article on something. Why don't you sit down and write the whole idea in one page? And then you have a little one page version that you can look at. And maybe there's a little research you need to do. and You need to look at the literature. Well, I'm going to read a few things. And instead of taking copious notes and giving yourself like many, many kind of pages of draft to sort through, what if you just sit down and write a one page lit review? And maybe it needs to be five pages and it needs 10 more references, but then you have something. And maybe you end up having, here's my main idea and here's a lit review and here's a little discussion. It's only three pages, but you can look at it and you can fix it and you can kind of make it better. So I like to try and do actually a lot of small things and then put them together or or then make a longer version of it. I mean, that's actually very similar to the process that I went through writing a, a grant proposal recently, whereas I wrote like a three-paragraph version of the whole thing. And like, what other sections do I need? Let me flesh those out. But it's all about small steps. And that feeling that you're – you need a feeling of progress. I mean, for learning, for behavior change – you need a f- sense of progress. And so that means the steps have to be small enough. If you're writing something and it's not getting done, reduce the size of the task. It's just that simple mm-hmm. or complexity. Yeah, I get these writing tips every week. And it's, it's selfishly a question that I want to ask because I want to get all of this. But I'm like Douglas. I find it hard to develop these habits and I need to get down and put this pen to paper, but I love those tips, you know, make it small and then flesh it out when, you you know, if it becomes five pages, we'll start off with a paragraph or one page and then develop it from there. Write every day. A, B, D. Yeah, I love that. Sometimes I need to write something and I, I write a few sentences and then I find myself writing, well, maybe you'll do this and maybe do that. And I just go, no, I'm going to, I need to get this done in the next three hours. I'm, it starts with three sentences. I'm going to write the beginning and I write the conclusion. And I'm only going to put in things here that I like. And it's a little different than writing a draft where you're putting all your ideas on paper. I'm just trying to make this part of the page okay. And that low, that limiting of your scope can really help. I mean, we all want to do, or at least a lot of people, I, I want to let me speak less generally. I want to do big things. Big things are really hard to do. Small things are easier to do. You want to do big things, yep. make it a set of small things, and then, and then chip away. That's right. 45 episodes. How many do you have, Frank? You have a ton. You're more than 100. Well, you are going to be number, I think, 121. Woo, that's a lot. That's wow. all. Yeah. Well done. One, two, one. Yeah, every week. This is a first. Right. A three way conversation. Right. Yeah, I, I actually loved it. Oh, it's oh. been really nice. Really nice. Doug and Edward, thank you so much for being so inspiring and for joining me on Economic Rockstar. I had a blast and I really learned a lot from you. Share it again with our listeners where they can find you. You can reach us at teachbetter.co and you can search for our podcast on iTunes. Uh, It's the Teach Better podcast. You can find all the links to Doug and Edward on economicrockstar.com forward slash Doug and Edward. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time. You are both an economic rock star. I think we're both. Thank you. It's great being here. We're both economic rock stars. You definitely look like one. (laughs) Yeah, with the long hair and everything. And Edward, you cut your hair, didn't you? He did. He did. Too bad. He went grunge on it. And I used to have mine like yours as well, yeah. I'm a conformist. Totally. Yeah. How are you? Yeah. <laughs> <It's a> cl- <laughs> That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a cutting edge conformist. Yeah, exactly. The closet conformist. <laughs> yeah, really. The new podcast. The closet conformist. All right. Well, this is great, Frank. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate it. All right. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Bye, Frank. Thanks very much. Great meeting you. Yeah. 
if you enjoyed this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com, where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.